Welcome to the webinar, The Geriatric Interview, Effective Techniques to Getting the Most Out of 15 Minutes. I'm Barbara Lewis, the Managing Editor for .com, an online communication skills learning system for medical schools, residency, PA, and NP programs, and hospitals, now that .com offers over 40 CME credits. The webinar will last about 30 minutes, and the recording and the PowerPoint will be available on the .com website very shortly. If you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box located in the panel or in the question box. If we don't have a chance to get to your question during the webinar, we will respond afterwards. Joining me today is Dr. Erica Manu and Dr. Brent Williams. Dr. Manu is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Michigan. She is board certified in geriatrics and palliative care and medicine, and she has a special clinical interest in palliative medicine applied to the care of older adults with a focus on dementia care and education for healthcare providers and caregivers. Her research interests include geriatric and palliative medicine education, medical education. She is a co-author of the .com module 23, The Geriatric Interview. And also with us today is Dr. Brent Williams. He is a professor of internal medicine at the University of Medi Michigan Medical School, and he is the director of the University of Michigan Medical School Global Health and Disparities Path of Excellence. He's also the medical director of the University of Michigan Complex Care Management Program. Obviously, he's quite busy. <laughs> he's a primary care physician, and he's published articles related to medical education and faculty development and co-edited a book on the care of hospitalized older patients. He is also a co-author of .com Module 23, The Geriatric Interview. Welcome. Thank you, Barbara. Great to be here. Yes, and we have a lot to cover today, so let's get started. So this picture might not be the most politically correct image, but it does depict quite realistically what awaits the American healthcare system as the population continues to age. Next slide. Um, during um, and by the end of our webinar, participants will learn about establishing the physical context and verbal communication skills when interacting with older adults and their caregivers. We'll learn about keeping cognitively impaired patients at the center of the interview, assessing and addressing caregiver stress, assessing and addressing um, team-based um, approach. As a general rule, um, our webinar and module 23 um, are intended to provide um, a menu of priorities and techniques um, to help providers interact with their older patients and their caregivers. Now, um, working with older adults with many comorbid conditions and psychosocial needs can be time consuming and complex. Therefore, um, as a caveat, it's important for provider to understand and remember that perhaps only few can be accomplished in any one visit um, of the elements of a comprehensive geriatric interview. However, if those elements are kept in mind, they can be addressed um, over time. Right? So to get you to think about what happens in the medical encounter, we present you a case. Mrs. Collins is a 78-year-old woman whom you have seen for the past five years. She comes in today with her daughter. Her daughter is worried about the patient being forgetful, misplacing things, and having difficulty driving. Your work is consistent with age-related cognitive impairment of Alzheimer's type. So here are some things for providers to consider before the visit with such a patient like Mrs. Collins. So how is her appointment scheduled? Do you have enough time to address the issues that you want to address. For forming a thorough chart review ahead of the visit might not only help review her medical history, but identify items for the agenda as well as avoid um, any duplication of care. Um, considering to use questionnaires before the visit, um, which patients can complete either at home or in the office with the help of staff or caregivers can serve, can identify issues that you might discuss during the visit 
and can help um, can help the encounter. Um, likewise, um, both for the patient and the caregiver and the, and the um, provider, it is important to have an agenda of items to address um, at each um, session. Arranging the physical environment is an important element of preparation, as well as um, to include or how to how to work around including the caregiver um, if we anticipate that the caregiver is going to be present. So in general, it's a good idea to perhaps set the expectation of uh, including the caregiver ahead of time at, at the beginning of the visit by communicating that you intend to spend some time alone with the patient. So for every patient that you see, not just for your older adults, it's very important to allow some time to spend with the patient. This is a good time to um, address um, sensitive questions such as um, abuse, neglect, um, um, ask about sexual activity and any concerns surrounding that, as well as um, about topics like MFI or thoughts of suicidality. Um, also, it's very important to check uh, with the patient about confidentiality, uh, mostly in relation to the presence of a caregiver, as well as inquire about um, if they have durable power of attorney completed or what the steps needed to complete one are. Um, how to arrange private time with the patient? As I mentioned, setting the expectation at the beginning of the visit usually helps um, dissipate the awkward moment when you have to ask for the caregiver to leave the room for a short period of time. Next slide. So our case continues. In the office, um, the patient's daughter quickly volunteers to share her concerns about the patient's memory lapses, driving problems, forgetting to take a medication. So the question that you face as a provider is how can you help keep the patient at the center of the interaction? So saying something like, it helps me to hear from your loved one, mother, whomever, directly, whether or not the information that he or she is providing me is correct or not, it is um, something um, to be discussed, but really this type of interaction provide so much more than just um, the questions themselves. Next slide. Here are some other examples of what providers can consider saying when the caregiver takes over from the patient. I will give you the opportunity to share your observations or when the patient defers to the caregiver for responses. I'm interested in your input or when the patient seems afraid to answer in front of the caregiver. In private, someone can say something like, I really want you to know that I'm here for you, and then continue with the specific problems that you're concerned about. So our case continues. Mrs. Collins does not initially seem bothered by any of the concerns that her daughter brings up. You ask the daughter to step out briefly and you interview the patient. You note know that the patient grows a little more anxious, asking when the daughter can return. So this observation does underline the importance of spending time alone with the patient. It may be a clue to her reliance on her daughter for answers and just um, emphasizes again and again the importance of having direct um, interactions with the patient. Next slide. Too often when we deal with patients with cognitive deficits, um, we tend to fail to interact with them. And here's why it's a very good practice to interview your patients with dementia, even though it's more time consuming than if you would talk with a patient without cognitive problems. This type of interaction provides information not only about their mental status, language abilities, but their affect behaviors as well as the relationship with their caregiver. Um, in all patients, but mostly in patients with cognitive deficits, it's important to watch for nonverbal non messages that can shed light to difficulties um, or strengths on the patient-caregiver relationship. So because the prevalence of underrecognized abuse and neglect is high, providers should be aware of a number of nonverbal messages that may pick up 
um, that they may pick up in an interview with a patient, such as no eye contact between the patient and the caregiver, more agitation or anxiety in the presence of the caregiver, or the patient is fidgeting, for instance. Next slide. Let's change gears a little bit. Let's talk about physical deficits. For every patient, um, you should make sure that um, patients can see and hear you in the office. Um, providers should learn to position themselves such that the patient is always comfortable during an interview. So next, we have a checklist of things to consider. For instance, um, positioning yourself at the eye level does help alleviate um, the perception of a power struggle or power difference between the provider and the patient. In patients with visual impairment, uh, and in all patients, it's important to assure proper light. Um, in patients with visual impairment, uh, lighting can um, pose diff different difficulties. For instance, problems with glare in patients with cataracts or um, not being able to distinguish details of the face of the provider. For patients with hearing impairment, um, having a lot of background noise may decrease their ability to hear you. One simple um, trick that I did not put up on the slide, but um, I often do with my older patients, is to make sure that they don't have earwax, because that can actually be a simple and quick to fix problem um, and improve their hearing. When, um, when we're talking about patients with hearing impairment, speaking clearly, facing the patient so they can read your lips, um, lowering your um, voice, and lowering the tone of your voice as much as possible. And this is somewhat more important for female providers because when you raise your voice, you actually raise the pitch of your voice as well so patients can hear you a lot less, actually. And then trying to avoid interruptions or distractions during the, the visit is also important. For patients with cognitive deficits, providers should watch for um, clues during the interview, such as vague responses, reliance on the caregiver for information, or word finding difficulties, and then confirm their findings by testing the patient as well as questioning the caregiver. However, I'm gonna mention that occasionally, directly questioning patients about cognitive deficits may lead to defensiveness and difficulties with completing a, completing a screening test later during the interview. So perhaps asking indirect questions, such as asking them about their recent health-related visits or any sociopolitical events um, may help um, reveal deficits. So our case continues, and in the process of data gathering, um, you decide to have the daughter join, um, rejoin the interview because the patient was looking quite anxious in her absence. While assessing older adults, and not just, but while assessing older adults, providers should review periodically geriatric syndromes, um, either on a yearly basis or at any time their health status changes. Um, elements like questions about memory, mood, sleep, falls or mobility, as well as nutrition and continence, um, adds to a more comprehensive understanding of the, of the patient's uh, needs. Something that providers need to remember is that older adults may have a tendency to downplay their symptoms and attribute to aging certain changes that may not be associated with aging, such as cognitive problems or problems with incontinence. So a diligent review of these syndromes may unveil not only a problem, but may help correct mis misconceptions that older adults may have. Also important is to mention that um, common illnesses may have atypical presentations or vague presentations in older adults. Therefore, a diligent review of systems and review of their symptoms may be necessary sometimes to tease out the actual medical problem. Next slide. In the, gathering, in the data gathering process, 
providers should pay attention to um, completing a careful history review, not only, like I said, to refresh their knowledge of the patient's medical history, but to avoid unnecessary testing, which can be costly and burdensome. A thorough medication review may identify polypharmacy, which is frequent in older adults, the use of five or more medications or medication, inappropriate medications to treat side effects of other medications is something that we oftentimes encounter. It is very helpful, if at all possible, to have a trained specialist like a pharmacist or a technician to help review the meds, as well as it's very important to do a thorough medication review after transition self-care. Those are times when, I'm sorry, can we just go back to the previous slide, Barbara? Those are times um, when changes can happen. Therefore, identifying uh, vulnerable um, times with older adults is important. Assessing psychosocial support is very, very important because it shapes all decisions to investigate or treat um, problems and illness in the elderly. Next slide. And part of the psychosocial assessment is a thorough periodic review of um, functional status including um, activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living um, with emphasis on those that I mentioned um, on the slide. Now, when providers have uh, um, the need to um, save some time, family history is one of the aspects that tends to be less important when um, it comes um, to older adults. However, Review of systems uh, becomes very important with diligent attention um, to any positives. Next slide. It is helpful to use open-ended questions when assessing um, living situation, um, functional status, as well as um, um, how, what kind of daily routine someone may have. Also, um, addressing um, questions related to values and preferences is best done by opening up the conversation with your older patients. Next slide. Um, here are some more open-ended questions that providers should consider when um, assessing values and preferences. Um, these tend to be very important in our attempt and efforts to um, provide um, patient-centered care. Next slide. Changing gears a little bit, I'm going to talk a few minutes about how um, much too often we tend to um, forget about including our cognitively impaired patients in the process of decision making. Decision making is context specific, and so providers need to remember to assess it accordingly. As an example, a patient with cognitive impairment may not be able to decide upon driving, but may be able to give their input in other smaller decisions such as timing of their medications or what kind of clothing to wear. When decisions are made um, with the caregiver, however, it's preferable to have the patient present um, during the conversation and periodically check back, check back with the patient to assure that they still are included in the conversation. As patients with cognitive impairment um, tend to change over time, caregivers may have difficulty not only assessing their, um, their needs, but assessing their symptoms. So spending some time teaching your caregivers about how to best um, detect distress in their loved ones um, is an important element. So look for grimacing, facial expression, pacing, um, and such um, are elements to point out to the caregivers. Another important conversation that we should have with all our older adults, but is also something that um, could be frightening or upsetting for patients with cognitive or physically impair physical impairment, is driving, because driving carries a symbolic importance about autonomy. And therefore, these conversations sometimes can get um, complicated. Speaking about driving, providers should know their state's rules 
things may differ from state to state as to um, the responsibility of um, reporting an impaired driver. So here is a list of questions that providers should make a habit of asking their older adults periodically um, and um, they open the conversation about driving. Now something to mention is that when you're anticipating to have such a conversation, you should be prepared to troubleshoot and um, come up with a plan, um, an interim plan maybe for transportation or um, a referral for driving assessment or rehabilitation or even a list of local transportation options for your patients. Another important element of um, interacting with this diet of a caregiver and a patient is to periodically assess caregiver stress. Caregiver stress is not um, rare. Um, it's um, not only impacting the caregiver, but the patient as well. So um, with the permission from the patient, caregivers can be interviewed separately, but we um, should take that opportunity to ask questions about burden, but also to praise our caregivers for the excellent job that they do on a regular basis. Next slide. Geriatric care is best given in a team. It's very important that team members know and learn each other's roles and understand the scope of authority and responsibility um, and then delegate tasks accordingly. The old saying of it takes a village to take care of a child tends to apply to some of our older adults as well. So in conclusion of our interview with older adults, it's important to review the plan of care both with the patient and the caregiver, provide written communication to refer back to when they arrive at home, if the patient has problems with their, their vision, um, giving something in a large print may be helpful. Utilizing teach-back techniques both for the patient and the caregiver assures that the plan of care gets implemented accordingly. Thank you. And Thank you so up. much. That was really very, very important information, and I really appreciate your giving us all your thoughts on how to deal with older patients. Thank you. So let me go into a little bit about .com. I did want to give everyone who's on the webinar a code to get a free 30-day trial subscription without credit card. A little bit about .com, our module authors are leading faculty. We have 42 modules that are each about one hour in length. We have over 40 CME MOC credits, and we have over 400 very realistic videos that are really loved by our learners. And whenever we have surveys, either from faculty or with learners, we they always say they just love the videos. We also have interactive annotated videos, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. And then we have a whole back end of faculty resources, which includes assignment, assessment questions, a terrific grading matrix that's color coded, and lots of resources. So here's just a sample module of .com. It's very consistent in format. It starts off with the rationale, the key concepts, learning goals, videos, uh, all throughout a behavioral checklist and references. This is an example of an annotated video. And what the learners see is that they actually hear the physician talking with the couple. In this case, it's Dr. Tim Quill delivering bad news. And he and I are going to be speaking at the American Medical Student Association conference on this subject of delivering bad news coming up soon. And as you go through the conversation, it's highlighted here on the right side as to what's being discussed. And if you click on this icon right here, out pops the physician telling you about what's going on in the back of his head and why he's pursuing the conversation the way that he is. We have a number of comprehension scores. And in this case, the physician is talking with the patient and the listener is checking off whenever an empathic comment should be made. 
And this video actually has been used as a predictor for learners who need remediation. And uh, the two of them talk, and the patient may say, oh, I'm you know, my husband, something happened with my husband, he had a heart attack. And the physician will say something like, and how's your sore throat? So the learner, the viewer, will check off where actual empathic comments should be made. And it helps people to to identify where an empathic comment is is necessary. Here's one on facial recognition, going through each of these faces and then clicking off which ones they are. It starts with five seconds, then three seconds, then one second, and then they're all uh, shuffled so that the they're all different. They're coming up at different times. We have tons of resources, facilitator guides, syllabi, and administration guides as well to help. And we have a number of free resources. This will be our 20th webinar. We have uh, all sorts of webinars on balance and self-care, different ones on responding to emotions, uh, delivering bad news, which I just talked about. But uh, check out our 20 that we have which cover a wide range of not only topics that are dot-com modules, but other topics as well. We also have a free podcast called Healthcare Communication, Effective Techniques for Clinicians. We've had over 10,000 downloads and more than 50 episodes have been released, and they cover all sorts of uh, topics, including this one. Dr. Manu talked about uh, geriatric care on one of our podcasts. So if you'd like more information, please feel free to contact me. Here are my coordinates, uh, my telephone number, and my email address. And if you put in the code WEBFEB19, W-E-B-F-E-B-1-9, you will get a one-month free trial subscription to .com, and we require no credit card when you sign up to do that to get that. So thank you to everyone who has joined us today. The recording and the PowerPoint will be on our website very shortly. Thank you very much.